We've all got the same 24 hours in a day. What you do with it is up to you, and the supplement you take can help you make every hour count. For the maintenance of good health, choose DS24. DS24 provides the perfect balance of vitamins, minerals, antioxidants, and essential fatty acids to make every day your best day. Your life demands DS. DS24 multivitamin and mineral daily supplement. Find the full DS range at all good pharmacies. Welcome everyone. Good evening. Welcome to another Wish um, webinar. Wish Wednesday webinar. Uh, today it is the focus of the brought to you by the running interest group from Wish. And we are very lucky to have Sean Pinkus with us this evening. Thank you to our sponsors, Asino. And also good evening to everybody in Cape Town who is in person this evening. evening. Um, Sean is going to be presenting on leg length discrepancies, myths and legends. I, if, if you have worked with me or Paris, you will know that a pet project is leg length discrepancies and the roles that it has in biomechanics that we see in our, in our, in our athletes and how it affects majority of running patients. So John actually teases me because he calls me the scanogram queen because I'm constantly sending the scanograms. So Sean also has a, a pet project of leg length discrepancies, and he actually did his honors dissertation or thesis on the on an inter and interrata comparison into the validity, reliability, or repeatability and reliability of commonly used leg length measure techniques. So this evening he's going to be talking to us on the myths and legends of leg length discrepancies. And this is a topic that should be talked about far more because this is something that is missed all the time. I see it in practice almost on a daily basis. So thank you very much, Sean. Take it away. So um, just want to say thanks to Wish again for the collaboration between CISA and Wish. And uh, thanks to Asina for the sponsorship. And in Cape Town, thanks to On and to Fancy Sport for the sponsorship. And there's a, a group of people behind me, as you guys can't see, so I'm speaking in person here in Cape Town. And thanks all for coming out, giving your time tonight. And I hope you are a little bit enlightened at the end about uh, leg length discrepancy. Um, like Lauren said, it's a, been a pet project of mine, and I know somewhere in the distance, Dennis Reebok and Mark are also cringing because they've heard me speak about this many, many times. And I had to resurrect it because there's about 20 years worth of people who've qualified who've never heard me say this. So I had to bring this one up. It's got to come back, bring it back, and it'll, I'll bring it out for again for about my 70th birthday, probably. That's the next time I lecture this. So if we move on, uh, leg length discrepancy, myths and legends, and I'm going to move on. And it's also what people, most people, some may, know, some may not know, is that it's known as Anis Amelia. That's its, its correct name. I've never referred to it as Anis Amelia. I call it leg length difference. Is what it is. So we're going to talk quickly about prevalence, causes, types, assessment, and management. And I'm going to spend quite a bit of time on the assessment side of it and the management side because that's really what's important. So if you look at the prevalence, 7 to 97% of the population have a leg length difference. And the majority of the literature reports 90% on the right side. There's a 90% of people have a prevalence of, uh, with the right side being longer, 70%. Now, that's really an academic thing. Uh, whether the left side's long or the right side long is absolutely, it's relevant if you're an academic doing a study and you need to write about something. But if you're a clinician, it's about and as useful as an ashtray on a motorbike. I don't need to know which side is longer. It's still going to manage it the same way. So the first and most obvious question is, why is there such a discrepancy in the literature of 7 to 97% of population? That's like saying everybody and nobody. And the reality is it comes down to the researcher and what they said to something called the critical difference. And the critical difference is the actual measured difference between the legs. So if I, as researcher A, decide that three millimeters is a leg length difference, I will find 97% of the population will have a difference. If I say two and a half centimeters is a, is a severe difference, then only 7% of the population will have it. So it depends on what difference you've set as being important to you or to your, your research. If you look at different, uh, uh, different disciplines, Podiatry, certainly when I was taught it and what I've always followed is around five millimeters is starting to become an issue. 
and that is backed by some of the research. Uh, physios, chiros sometimes say nine millimeters to a centimeter of difference. Orthopedic surgeons are only interested at two, two and a half centimeters because that's a surgical cutoff. So it depends on what you consider to be your critical difference, depends on what there is, what, 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 where you're going to start intervening. But the reality is when you're looking at biomechanics, and I'm going to talk about microtrauma, a small difference can be a big problem. Keep that in mind. Remember also that the critical difference only refers to a structural difference, as in a measured difference in length, one side relative to the other. So now, in every one of my PowerPoint displays, there's a typo. This one's pretty obvious. I'm sure you can all pick it up by now. There's an E missing on there. I didn't see it. Neither did Calvin when he proofread it. <laughs> Calvin's dyslexic, he says. So. <laughs> No, I'll get some else to prove it next time. So the argument is, if leg length difference is prevalent in most of us anatomically, then it's a normal feature. And the answer to that argument is yes, it is a normal feature. But why is it a problem? Because modern urban humans live and function and play on hard, flat, man-made symmetrical surfaces. And I hope that makes sense because the whole idea of the foot is to accommodate to the surface that it's on. So if the foot is constantly accommodating to a hard flat surface, over time, a small difference to which we are accommodating can then become repetitive micro trauma that will cause a problem. So a small difference of three to five millimeters is actually potentially an important consideration in a person. If you think about this, take a Formula One engine. There are people who love Hamilton and people who love Vettel. So we're going to get to Vettel's car because more people seem to love him. I hate him. But in his car, we're going to make one crank engine, one crank arm of one piston, three millimeters longer than the rest of the crank arms in the engine. That engine will fail. There's no question. It's not a big difference. It's only three millimeters in one crank arm. The human is no different. If you're doing something repetitively time after time, and there's a small difference to which you're accommodating, it can potentially become a problem. So the causes of limb length discrepancy, there's really three real differences. It's congenital or, congen or genetic. So genetic, mom, dad, granny, grandpa, somebody's got a leg length difference and you're going to have the same difference coming through later on. Congenitals, generally you're born not with the leg length difference, but it will develop as you grow and get older. That difference will be there. It's not going to go away. It is what it is. The human being is asymmetrical, left side to right side. And because we are bipedal and stand on uh, two legs all day, every day, and we are cephalad and caudal and face forward, that leg length difference is going to become a small problem. Okay. Acquired, post-traumatic or post-disease. So post-traumatic, somebody breaks a leg, a child breaks a leg, and they get a, 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 a fracture through the, the growth plate. That leg may not grow as fast as the other side that can cause a leg length difference. Similarly, somebody may have Percy's disease when they're young, which is a, 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 a um, the word's escaping me in a minute, but problem with the growth plate when, when, when they're growing, um, and they're gonna get one, the hip joint's not gonna grow properly, one leg's gonna be shorter. Post polio, cancers, all of those can cause problems with uh, potentially cause a leg length difference later on down the line. And I'm not gonna spend too much time because the causes unless you're picking up the cancer, are really relevant. It's you managing the condition, not the cause in this particular case. And the, you're managing what the condition causes later. Are there different types? Well, there are different types of leg length difference. It's called structural. Some people call it real, functional. Some people call it apparent. So people talk about structural or functional or real or apparent. And then there's an environmental leg length difference. So environmental leg length difference, just this last weekend, we had two oceans. And one of the classics that happened with two oceans is people run in the camber of the road. And the camber is so big that one leg constantly functions shorter than the other. And they come back after two oceans and I've never had RTB, but now I've got RTB. And it comes from, a con from the, the, the environmental leg length difference. We don't need to touch on that again. Just question your patient. What were you doing? Where were you running? How did it happen? But structural and functional, is where it's all at. And that's where a lot of the work has to go into deciding. 
Points to remember different types of leg length difference. And I've said this before, a functional leg length difference, okay, a functional leg length difference can, can, can appear on its own without a structural element. A structural leg length difference will always have some functional component attached to it. And it's important to differentiate what is it because are you dealing structural or functional? Very often, it's a combination of the two. When I talk about myths, we are all taught that the foot on the long side will pronate and the foot on the short side will supernate always. No, that is a complete myth. That was researched and they found it's exactly true in 50% of the cases. So do not rely on that as an indicator. If you see someone pronating on one foot and supernating on the other, do not assume which is which. You still need to assess and check. If most people have a leg length difference, it's normal and nothing to worry about. Again, wrong. Because we're discussing micro trauma, how a small difference can create micro trauma going forward. If there's a leg length difference, it may be part of the etiology of the problem. It's not necessarily the only etiology, but it's part of the problem. Most people will accommodate for or compensate for a leg length difference and it doesn't need to be treated. Read myth two. If there's a Leg length difference there, it needs to, be uh, needs to be treated. A tape measure is an acceptable form of measurement. So, my thesis, we did that. So, we go back to the word critical difference. If your critical difference is five millimeters or one centimeter, so somewhere between five millimeters and a centimeter, you say leg length difference is becoming important and you measure with a tape measure. It has nothing to do with your skill, and I'm not bashing anyone's skill. The standard deviation of a tape measure method is plus or minus five millimeters, which means I can measure, and this is what I did my thesis, I measured five people 10 times each, so 50 measurements. On each measurement, I was plus or minus five millimeters. So if you've got a person whose legs are exactly the same length, and on one occasion, I measure one leg five millimeters longer, and the other leg five millimeters shorter, I have created a leg length difference of a centimeter. The converse is true, which means with a tape measure, you can create or negate a leg length measurement that does or does not exist. And if that is the most vague statement you've ever heard in your life, it's true. That's exactly what you do with a tape measure. So do not rely on tape measures unless you're measuring greater than a centimeter. But remember, you're still plus or minus five millimeters. So the methods that are commonly used, tape measure, plus or minus five millimeters, commonly measured from the anterior superior iliac spine to medial malleolus. Some people measure to the lateral malleolus. Some people measure from the umbilicus. Okay, so you gotta remember that you're putting the tape measure here and you're holding it down here somewhere. And then you have to look where you are here. So one of the things you've got is an area of parallax. And the second thing is, you're trying to measure on a rounded malleolus exactly a point. So you can create, that's where your measurements come from, where the problems come from in your measurement. Similarly, somebody who's very, is obese, doesn't have to be obese, just a little bit overweight. It just has to be a little bit of fluff in front of the anterior superior iliac spine and you can't find it properly. If they're extremely muscular, you can't get your finger into the right place. You can't feel the bone because there's muscle involved. If they're ticklish, it's, a, it's always fun when you're trying to measure some of the tape measure in a ticklish, falling all over the plinth while you're trying to measure them. Okay? And then very often, if one leg is bigger than the other, the pathway of the tape measure from one point to the other can be different left leg to right leg. So there's so many variations in using a tape measure that I put it in that ashtray on the motorbike. And if you're going to do one thing tonight, please stop using a tape measure. Remember that one. Eyeballing. So you can do this with a patient prone. You can do it with a patient supine. Just make sure that the pelvis has been leveled. Look at the, make sure the pelvis is level on the, on the table and look at the patient prone. So you're looking at the malleolar position. Do they line up left to right side? You can look at the plantar surface of the heel. You can look at the foot when they're lying, if they're lying supine, you'll just look at the malleolus. Okay, so you can look at them. You can even look at them standing up. Just look at the patient standing. What do you see? The block method, 
Does anyone know what the block method is? I'm asking people in front of me, put your hands up if you know the block method. So what you do is you use blocks of known thickness. So a three millimeter or five millimeter, palpate the ASIS, put in a three millimeter block or five mil block, palpate again, and you keep doing that till the pelvis looks level. And then you can assume that. The problem with that is that is only checking a structural difference. It's not including function at all. So the block method, the literature does state it's one of the most accurate, but again, there's a shortcoming that you're not including the functional changes. Weight-bearing scanogram is the gold standard. Weight-bearing scanogram has a, a, a standard deviation of plus or minus one millimeter, okay? But it must be a full-length weight-bearing scanogram. There's a variety of ways of doing a scanogram. One of them is a scrolling method. That doesn't work as well. The full-length weight-bearing measurement, and when I get to looking at scanograms later, you'll understand why it's important to do it that way. Some radiologists are using CT. CT is fantastic for measuring the length of the bone, but again, it's not weight-bearing, so you're losing a lot of information. The clinical process to evaluate LRD. It's a long, busy slide, and I've got a lot to say on this, so just make sure you've got a cup of tea in Joburg or a whiskey. You'll have whiskey later here. The guys here in front of me, stick with me. So the first part of that leg link difference is your history and, and your injury, your injury history and injury profile. So discussing with a patient what's going on, they will, you will get clues out of the history that there is potentially a leg length difference. And the kind of clues you're going to be looking at is the injury is always on the same side. They keep getting the same injury. I get plantar fasciitis on the right, then I'd RTB on the right. I will lower back pain on the right. I'll get knee pain on the right. That kind of pattern of injury, where it's always unilateral. Patterns of repair or repetitive injury. I keep rupturing my left hamstring. You rehab it, everything's done properly. The patient comes back, they've done the injury again. So you keep getting patterns of repetitive injury. Those are all clues in your history that you might potentially be looking for a leg length difference. Unilateral perceived weakness or fatigue. Ask the patient that question. When you exercise or run or do your sport, do you find one leg gets tired quicker than the other or one leg feels weaker than the other? If the answer is yes, that should be alerting you immediately that there is potentially a leg length difference. So ask those questions. The inability to perform patterns or movements in sport. And here I think of something like, uh, a high jumper running in a pattern to jump, a uh, basketballer laying up a ball, a volleyballer running to, to, to jump, to lay up a set up a spark. If they can do the pattern one way, but they can't do it the opposite way. The reason for that is they're un unable to take off either the long leg or the short leg, and that's why they can't do the pattern in both directions. So if you ask them what happens with those, they'll tell you. The obvious one, do you get lower back pain? The majority of people I see will tell me they have lower back pain. That's not why they're presenting to me. They just live with back pain like it's a normal thing. But if somebody has a problem and lower back pain, there's a good chance there's a leg length difference, be it functional or structural, and you need to interrogate further and see what's going on. Then clinical observation of the patient in relaxed stance, standing in what's called angle and base of gait. Angle and base of gait means their normal foot position as they would normally comfortably stand. And you're going to look at them, you're going to look at the head position, shoulder level, hip level, look at their knees. There's going to be clues in the knees. Genovarum, genovalgum, genorecurvatum. If it's unilateral or greater on one side, that's at least pointing, if not to structural, definitely it's going to be pointing to a functional difference. Let me get a bottle of water. Okay. So looking at the patient just in, in stance. Then palpation of the anterior super, superior iliac spine in resting and neutral calcaneal stance position. I'm going to follow this on with a slide that's a bit more detailed than that, but that's one of the techniques. Putting your patient prone or supine, checking the malleolar level or the, the plantar surface of the foot, but only once you've, once you've managed that, uh, check that the pelvis has been checked to be level. There's a variety of techniques to do that. Thank you, Calvin. There's a variety of ways to do that. To make sure the pelvis is level and then go back down and check. Gait features, again, there's a slide on gait features. 
there are lots and lots of clues in GATE that are going to alert you to the fact that there's potentially a leg length difference. Pressure plate features, not everyone has a pressure plate. But if you have a pressure plate, it's sometimes a surefire way of saying there's a leg length difference. There's a slide later that I'll discuss that. Then what I do in my practice is I've got all of these different ways of looking at the patient. So I'm not looking purely for leg length difference, but as part of my assessment, it's running in my brain. It's, a, it's an operating system. I'm looking to see if there's a leg length difference. If I see a potential leg length difference, do all my clinical checks give me the same side? So in other words, the hip is lower on the left side. The left leg looks shorter and prone. When they're standing, it looks shorter on the left side. If all my clinical checks point to the same side, then I can be clinically certain that there's a leg length difference one side versus the other. If sometimes, and it often happens, you will see the patient when they're standing, the anterior superior expands higher on one side. When they lie down, now the opposite leg looks, looks shorter and you get discrepancies in your clinical assessment then you will proceed to do a weight-bearing scanogram because there's no nonsense about the weight-bearing scanogram. If the patient comes in and tells you, I have a leg length difference, ask them, how was it measured? If they say with a tape measure, discount that, send them for a scanogram. I will show you a case just now, which proves my point. So hang in, they're all coming. All of these things are coming just now. So you're going to use your x-ray if there's clinical uncertainty with your, if there's uncertainty in your clinical assessment, then you'll confirm it with the x-ray. So resting in neutral calcaneal stance position comes from the root theory, which I've discussed before in previous lectures. And what you're going to do with a patient in angle and base of gait, you're going to check anterior superior iliac spine level in resting calcaneal stance position, that's where the foot resting. The podiatrist around you will be able to teach you what's neutral calcaneal stance, but essentially it's allowing the patient to invert or evert the foot to a point where the talus is neither pronated or supinated. Okay, that's resting cal neutral calcaneal stance position. Then you go back up and check the anterior superior iliac spine. Very important, ethical feature. If you're going to be touching someone's ASIs, tell them, I'm going to touch you here. Don't just grab their waist or their pelvis because you might be found that you have a bit of litigation in your hand. So tell them exactly what's going to happen. What you'll often find when there's a leg length difference, whether it's functional or structural, is the position of the anterior superior iliac spine will change in resting and then again in neutral calcaneal stance position. So you'll be able to start differentiating is it structural, functional, or a combination of both. Now, the root theory in its entirety has been discounted and argued by the pediatric community and pretty much tossed by the wayside around the world. This is the one part of root theory that I still find very effective and very useful in determining structural versus functional leg length difference. So just so that you guys in Jobberg don't know, I've got my notes here, you see, because it doesn't come up on the screen because when I share screen, I can't see my notes. So moving on, Gait features. I said there was going to be a lot of different things in gait when you're watching gait. So the first one is rising over the long side and dropping onto the short side. That can be seen at the head, the shoulders, the hips, any one of those things. You can see the patient rising and dropping over the long side, dropping down onto the short side. Don't look at unilateral pronation or supination because that is a red herring. That will put you off, uh, put you off target. So just looking at the rise and drop of the person as they walk away from you and back towards you, or on a treadmill if you use a treadmill. A unilateral abductory twist of the foot. Now what that is, is as a person toes off, the millisecond the heel clears the floor, the forefoot will abduct. The heel will twist around the foot like that. It's called an abductory twist. If you see an abductory twist on one side only, it's an indicator that that is the shorter side. That is one of the features that you will see as, as a gait swing. Unilateral arm swing or no arm swing. So there's a failure of the spinal engine. And when the person walks, if you can imagine this arm's going like this, they're walking, and this arm stays stuck to their side. When you see that, that's an indicator that there's potentially a leg length difference. Head tilt to one side, often following the shoulder, or sometimes trunk lean. The entire trunk will lean toward the short side. Those are all potential gait features. Asymmetrical rotation of the pelvis. So when you watch the person walking, 
The pelvis should be moving nice and symmetrically around itself like that. If it's moving only on one side, that is potentially a sign of a leg length difference. Asymmetry in the curvature of the waist. So you look at the sides of the waist. The one side is straight. The one side's got a big curve. That is, again, another feature. That said, there are a lot of other things that can cause any of those features. So don't think it's only leg length difference. You've got to look for all the other features. I didn't say this was going to be simple. I said this was going to be a, something that you're going to learn from. So when you're seeing those things, put into your mind, is this possibly a leg length difference or is leg length difference possibly part of what is causing the patient to be through the front door? If you look at the picture on the, the left side, that is what's called navicular drop and drift. So in other words, I don't know if you can see the mouse there and there, that's where the navicular is. The arches collapse and the navicular drops and drifts inward. That is equal and bilateral on both sides. If you look at the picture on the right side, it's a unilateral navicular drop and drift. Now, most people would look at that and say, his, it would be his left foot is the shorter side and the right foot, the, the left is, is longer, the right is shorter. Not always. But when you see that, that is most certainly a functional leg length difference, but it could potentially be a structural difference as well. So understanding scanograms. Firstly, weight bearing is best because it shows how the feet and the lower limbs are loaded and it shows it puts the pelvis sometimes into different positions. It is considered the gold standard to measure leg length difference, but we don't have to radiate everybody, only those people we need to radiate. When we measure it, we can do more than just measure the overall length of the, of, of the lung bones. So a lot of people will look, some people measure from the pelvis, from the, the femoral head down to the, the, the tibia. You can do a lot more than that. You can measure each limb individually, each bone individually. You can measure the femurs and compare them. You can measure the tibia and compare them. You can measure the foot position from the floor to the tailor dome. Very often, you will find that there's no difference in, in, in foot position or structure, but one foot, the actual talus, the tailor dome, is shorter on one side compared to the other. So although both legs are the same length, there's a structural difference in the feet. And that's something that you could only see on scanogram. You can see the frontal plane position of the knee and hips. That's important. If you're looking potentially that there's genovarum, genovalgum, or there's osteoarthritis in one of the joints, let me just turn this off. There's osteoarthritis in, the, in, in one of the compartments. That's a very good way. You're getting a lot more bang for your buck by doing that. Look at the pelvic position. And again, when I go through some of the scanograms now, you will see some of the things that I'm going to show you where you're looking at pelvic position. You're looking at symmetry of the pelvis and position of the sacrum. So there's a, a lot that you can see when you look at a scanogram, apart from just measuring leg length. So we look at scanograms. That is in James Beach, if I'm not mistaken. That's in James Beach. I just repainted those, those the little huts. Go from Java, come visit us in Cape Town. Okay, so the first patient I'm going to show you, the 18 year old runner presented with a sent to me with a stress fracture of, of one of her feet. I forget which one. It's a while ago since I saw her. But she has, if you look at the full body picture, she has a known scoliosis. She's got quite a big scoliosis. If you look at the full length scanogram on the left, there's a genital volume bilaterally greater on the right. She has a measured leg length difference of only five millimeters. Okay. If you look at her feet, I don't know if you can see it on this picture, but if you look at her feet, the foot function was such that it exacerbated the leg length difference on the short side. So where everybody said that, you know, where I talk about don't look at pronation and supination as being your giveaway, she was completely the opposite. The foot function on the short side was worse. And so what the foot function does is it will exacerbate a leg length difference on the short side. So when you're looking at a patient like this, you're looking at a whole lot of things. If you look at the image of her knees, you can actually see that there's a small difference at her knee level. If you look at the little the grid pattern, you can see that the one knee is higher than the other. Next patient is an 82-year-old male, is a golfer. 
He has a known scoliosis. He has marked osteoarthritis of his lumbar spine. He walks with a complete right-sided trunk lean. He gets a lot of hip pain on the right side. And in fact, he's gotten to the point where he sits, when he drives, he actually has to put a raise under his right hip to keep him level, because that's one of the ways he controls his pain. He's got a unilateral navicular drop and drift. So if you look down at the bottom of the picture, so again, if you can see the mouse, if you look down at the ankles, you can see that the one foot pronates a lot more than the other. And again, it pronates more on the short side than on the long side. This patient, she's 20-something oh, runner. She has a structural and a functional component. Remember I showed you that picture of bilateral navicular drop and drift. In her case, you can see that there's bilateral navicular drop and drift. It's greater on the left side, okay, which is, again, on her long side. Okay? She has a structural and a functional component to her leg length difference. Journey volume bilaterally, mild pelvic rotation. You can see it's higher on the one side than the other. And if you look at the widths of the innominates, the innominate is wider on one side than the other. That will happen when there's a pelvic rotation. So if you can imagine the innominates like this, if the pelvis does this, this is going to look wider than that. So the pelvic rotation is given away by the fact that the innominates look asymmetrical on the X-ray. This patient, 60 years old, it says it took about 60 years. For 60 years, he was told he had a leg length difference of one centimeter and he's got a raise in one side. When we sent him for scanogram, his measured difference is only four millimeters. He was measured with a tape measure 60 years ago. So he's been walking around with a raise on one side for over 60 years, gets a lot of back pain, and he hasn't, hopefully getting marked. The complication now, if you look at this guy, is he's got medial compartment osteoarthritis bilaterally. What increased his leg length difference was the fact that there's a functional component. If you look at the ankle x-ray as a tailor dome, he's slightly higher on one side than the other. So that increased what was potentially a difference. So when I say don't use something like the block method in, 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 uh, in isolation, if you use just the block method, you're not taking the functional component into account. You can then see a leg length difference that's bigger because you haven't taken the functional component away. This patient here is a 15 year old girl. She has had numerous surgeries. When I say numerous, I'm talking over 10. And she has got a, if you look at the, the, the yellow arrow, it gives you, a, there's, a, there's a giveaway there. She's standing with a first fixed plantar flexion on the left side. So that leg is functioning longer, although there's no structural difference in leg length. If you measure her legs are exactly the same length. Now, what you're going to do is look at the picture of the pelvis. And you can see that the innominates and the whole pelvis is completely rotated. It's completely asymmetrical. Okay. So the left innominate is wide, the right is narrow. You can see that the pelvic ring is completely oblique. The obturator foramen does not, is not equal on both sides. The left femoral head is higher than the right femoral head. These are all features that you would look at. If you looked at that without knowing your history, you'd say, my word, there's a huge leg length difference. And what we did to get her right is we put her into wedge heel shoes. So we picked up the other side to be the same as the, 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 the functional long side. And the minute we did that and I videoed her and watched her walking, she walks completely normally. Her pelvis returns to a normal position. Now, if you leave a patient like this untreated for a long period of time, that pelvic position will become fixed. The muscles around the pelvis are all shortened in that, in, in that direction. The spine is potentially going to blow apart at some point in the future. So what we're going to do with her is we're going to leave her on the heel raise and reduce it over a period of time, and hopefully that calf will settle down. The reason we're not going to look to surgery is because, like I said, she's already had in excess of 10 ops. And sending her back to theatre for another op is just not available at the moment. So we're going to work conservatively and see how she settles down. Now, we need to remember that 
When you use orthotics to control a functional component of leg length difference, you're potentially removing a compensation that the body's had for that leg length difference, which means if you put orthotics into somebody who's got a leg length difference, and suddenly they come back and say, oh, now my back's killing me, it doesn't mean your orthotic is wrong. It means you must send the patient back to the podiatrist with that measure, with that note, so that we can reinterrogate and possibly add a lift to one of the sides. So all it means is it's more work for the podiatrist. We can see compensations for leg length difference at any particular site. So it can be a scoliosis, pelvic tilts or rotations of the whole pelvis or just of an innominate. You can see rotation of the sacrum. Usually in younger people, it goes toward the long side, it's level, and then it can go toward the short side. And that's something you need to be in mindful of when you're dealing with an older patient who's got a leg length difference. Because in some patient, older patients with leg length difference, you actually can't use lift therapy because you're going to create more of a problem by lifting one of the sides when the body's got that level of compensation. You can get coxavera, coxavalga, genuvarum, genuvalgum, genuvacurvitum, plantar flexion of the foot on one side, pronation or supination, unilaterally, bilaterally, or to varying degrees with or without compensations. So you can get absolutely anything and any compensation. And it's part of the job of the person who's going to be putting in the lift therapy and or the orthotics to evaluate that patient to see what is wrong and how can you assess them and how can you control them best. So I said that you're a pressure plate clue. So if you have a look at that, if you look on the one side, you see a yellow arrow and the other side is a red arrow. What that shows you is that on the shorter side, the heel contact time is only 30%. And consequently, there's less pressure on that side. And on the, the left-hand side is a red arrow, shows you that there's a heel contact time of 36%. Now, remember I spoke about an abductory twist. That's part of an early heel lift on the one side, which is potentially part of a leg length difference. But remember, this person could just have a tight calf on one side. So you have to evaluate holistically and put everything into, into perspective. So the mindset that if the body compensates for leg length difference, we don't need to worry about that, we worry about leg length difference, is in my opinion, wrong. Because we all understand, anybody in rehabilitative medicine or sports medicine understands the concept of microtrauma. Repetitive microtrauma over time with enough movements will eventually cause pain. So if we understand that, the management of leg length difference is to manage the cause of the microtrauma, which in this, some cases is including within the total management, managing the leg length difference. Remember that the human body can hide a leg length difference better than our government can hide style and cash. It's not as obvious as being in a couch. Okay, so when you, you think there's a leg length difference, interrogate it properly and make sure, satisfy yourself that it's not there, that it's not part of the deal. As I said, the history and physical examination and if needed x-rays can lead you to a point where LRD is fully understood in the context of that patient's presenting condition. Remember that line, I'm gonna come back to it. And only once you understand it, can your management be complete and, and, and implemented. Management must be multidisciplinary. There's a reason why I say that management must be multidisciplinary because if a person has been compensating around a fixed structural position for a long enough time, the body can assume that to be the normal pattern. You get muscle shortening, muscle lengthening, muscle weakness, muscle strength. That all needs to be managed by disciplines other than a podiatrist. So the chiros, the physios, the bios all come into play and I'll discuss that a bit more now. Now I want you to think of a leg length difference. Of a leg length difference. If a runner has got a one centimeter difference that they've compensated for absolutely fine and they're running on a hard, flat, symmetrical road, Every hundred steps, they've risen one centimeter on one leg and dropped down one centimeter on the other leg. Means on a flat road, they've had a one meter elevation gain or drop in their body. Now, we know that a normal person runs 990 steps per kilometer. So take that 900, 900 steps into a standard marathon and start putting in your mind the microtrauma that can potentially be occurring by a leg length difference. So when someone comes in with repetitive injury, I keep getting RTB on one side. Have a look. 
Is it the wrong side or the short side? What's happening? Leg length difference may be part of, I'm going to keep harping on it. It's part of the management. It's not the total management. Orthotics. So obviously management of leg length difference, if we're dealing with functional structural issues involving the foot, you're going to be using orthotics. So you will have functional control as per whatever the foot needs. Each foot can be different with or without heel raising, because if it's a functional difference only, you sometimes control one foot completely differently to the other. If you're going to then start adding in a heel lift, it's going to be added in. Heel lifts can sometimes need to be added in in increments. So if someone's got a difference of a centimeter, you don't go slap in a one centimeter heel raise, because I promise you, that patient will be back at your rooms within 10 days, telling you they hate you. Why do I know this? Because out there, there's somebody who hates me. I learned this very early on in my career. So when you're going to start adding, the bigger the difference in leg length, the longer it's going to take for you to add in incremental raises to get the patient to a point where you find their sweet spot, where they are happy and pain-free. And that's a key. How much raising do you add in? There's no measurement technique to say you need so much. You need to add in as much as is necessary for the patient's symptoms to go away. Generally, try getting into within five millimeters, but it doesn't have to be that. So you're going to add the raise over a long period of time. If you're doing an external heel or shoe lift, some people with a bigger lift, with a bigger difference, we have to go externally on the shoe. Very important to make sure that that, that external lift is shaped correctly so that the foot can toe off properly. Otherwise, you're going to fix one problem and create another. So the shape of that external heel lift is vital. I said I'd speak about physiotherapy and chiropractic, but we know that physiotherapy and chiropractic, I'll get to bias now, Lorraine, I'll get to just now. So physio and chiro deals with the same things, sometimes slightly differently. Uh, they look at the manipulation, adjustment, and rehabilitation of the functional changes that can have happened around the landscape of that particular patient's leg length difference and body shape and how they've been functioning. So if you are treating a patient with leg length difference, it is almost always, in my case, that I will be sending the patient to the physio or to the bio for additional treatment. And in rehabilitative medicine, no man is an island. You cannot do it all yourself. Doesn't matter which discipline you're from, you need the other disciplines to assist. Biokinetics, physio, and chiropractic, there's very often going to be weaknesses in and around the body. In all of those scanograms I showed you, every single one, there was a genu vulgum because they had glute needs that were not functioning. That's the bio's job. Bio's have about 15,000 exercises just for the left glute, possibly some more for the right side. So if you're seeing any functional change muscularly, you need to be rehabilitating strength-wise as well. When you're dealing with patients where the sacroiliac joint is blocked or not functioning, Again, purely a subjective opinion. The chiros come into play. A lot of physios do this as well. So I'm not going to put one discipline ahead of the other. But as a referring practitioner or practitioners who are into referring, all four disciplines play a role in the management of these patients. Surgery, again, there's no orthopedic surgeons in front of me today, but they're only interested at two and a half centimeters. Under two and a half centimeters, you're fine, mate. You're good to go. Not necessarily. They will either do a shortening on or a shortening or, or lengthening, depending. They use sometimes use something called the Ilizarov technique, which is where they put an external fixator around the bone. And every day the patient has to open a couple of screws and it distracts the fracture site away from itself and it grows toward that. Takes a long, long time. The rehabilitation from these operations is extensive. So if somebody's going to be having these operations, you need to counsel them that you are not going for a nip and tuck. You're not going to be looking great in six weeks' time. That's a long, long, long process. The rehab is very long. There is an internal fixator, which has got a limited extender. So like a bicycle cog, it rotates out and locks and keeps going with it and it lengthens over a period of time. Uh, I don't know if they're still done in South Africa. I know that this was used by a surgeon 
20 years ago and 20 years ago just that that, that device was over 100,000 rand so I don't know if it's going to be available in South Africa and more it might be a little bit expensive and why am I not moving forward there we go so limit discrepancy in sports I'm just going to discuss niggling difference in sports this is up for a sports medicine facility and a sports medicine talk but legally difference in sport can be a blessing or a curse. And the reason I say that is it can enhance movement or it can detract from movement. It can create strength on one side, weakness on the other. And some sports people will have learned that their body functions in a specific way and that's what they do. I'll give you examples. You might find there's a guy playing flank in rugby. He finds that he can flank better on the right side than on the left side of the scrum. Why on the right side? Because that's his longer leg. He's got more power on that side. So he naturally will choose to be on that side because that's where he's got greater power. If they go to the left side, he's now weak on the left side. He's not as good. So he'll choose that. I once treated a, a pair of, of rollers, and they each had a leg length difference. One was on the right side, one was on the left side. And, and they had big differences. They were 15 more than two centimeters. They were big differences. But they had chosen, through years of experience rowing, to put the blade on the side of their long leg because that's how they were most efficient and most powerful. So sometimes in sport, the sport will choose you to do whatever that movement is. If you think about it, some people kicking a ball, it's easier to kick the ball with a short leg because the leg can swing free of the floor more easily. So apparently, I don't know if this is true, David Beckham has a leg length difference and he's such a good spot kicker because he kicks with his short leg. If it's urban legend, I don't know, but it's a good story. Take it. Okay. Cricket bowlers. Cricket bowling must be probably the stupidest movement in all sport. It's a great sport. I love cricket. But it's the stupidest movement. You run, you jump, you stop, and then you go over. But what happens is you land on one leg and you have to go over the other leg. Now, if you're trying to go over a long leg, you might find it's more difficult to deliver the ball properly. So you find that a bowler... They might bat right-handed, but they can bowl left-handed because it's easier to go over the shorter left leg. I'm not saying that's always the case, but these are the things that guys will learn through doing years of sport that their body will allow them to run a pattern in one direction, not necessarily another. Golfers, if a golfer has a leg length difference, ask them, is it easier to hit the ball at an uphill lay or a downhill lay? And I'll tell you, I can hit the ball this way easier, but when it's the other way, I really battle. Look for a leg length difference because you may find that, say, for example, the left leg is shorter on an uphill lie, the left leg's higher, now their body's symmetrical because of the environment and it's easier to hit the ball or vice versa. Okay, cycling leg length difference in cycling can be relevant, however, it can also be a pain in the backside because if the difference is in the femur only, and again, you need a scanogram to understand that. Your saddle position can become so tight and so, so careful that one or two millimeters forwards or backwards, changing the cleats one or two millimeters forward or backward to get the person level on a bicycle. Remember, a bicycle is an extremely symmetrical thing. It can only do what it can do. The engine on top is asymmetrical. And that's the job of the bike fitter to make sure that we get that person as accurately as possible on the bicycle. So cycling can be a problem. Weightlifting. Think of a weightlifter. Somebody is doing, has got 150 or 200 kilos of their CrossFit or 450 kilos on top of their shoulders, and they're trying to do a movement where one leg is shorter than the other. That weight's going to be unbalanced. So if you can correct the leg length difference, you can now correct and give more power to one of the sides. So you can change that person's ability. So correction of leg length difference and foot function can be seen in elite sport as doping. But it's legal doping. We can do it. It's allowed. There's no test for it. So we can do it. Mandler. We can do it. Okay. Athletics. If somebody's got a long, a short left leg and a longer right leg, easier to run around the track because all tracks go in one direction. If you get them to run the other way, it's a problem. Now, if you get a patient with a leg length difference where the left side is short and the right is, the left side is long and the right is short, make them train in the other direction. They look at you like you've absolutely lost your marbles, but you know what? The injuries will go away. 
because they're constantly navigating a bend on the wrong side. So that's going to cause a compensation that's going to hurt them. So start thinking about the sport and what's going on with the patient. And I've, what have I done? Okay. So in conclusion, there are no hard and fast rules. Please do not apply hard and fast rules. A difference of X is a problem. A difference of less than X is no longer a problem. The foot on the other side pronates and this one. Take those and out of your mind. They are hard and fast rules are not essential. You need to use a combination of knowledge from your history, your clinical skills and assessment, and confirm with the scanogram if there is doubt. Heel lifts on their own do help a bit in some cases. And if they do help a bit in some cases, Send the patient to the podiatrist to get checked for orthotics because that may help a lot more. Rather look at a functional orthosis with appropriate lifts if indicated. The old adages, the short side will supinate, the long side will pronate is true in exactly half the cases and the body will accommodate, don't worry, please don't rely on those things. So I don't know if there's any questions, but I'm just going to finish off. That's a picture of the ocean, guys, Joburg, it's the ocean, the ships, and sun setting and rocks and things. And then just before I finish, thanks to our sponsor tonight, to Facey. For those of you who don't know, Helen Beely won the Boston Marathon wearing an on shoe. The new, what's it, the Cloud Trial One. It's a triathlon shoe, actually. Internet connection is unstable. So, Lauren, are there any questions? Any questions that side? I've only had one question, which I answered in the Q and A, um, which was, when would you advise strength and conditioning to allow the younger patients uh, to allow the younger patients to readapt prior to orthotics or during orthotics management, and then taper the orthotics according as strength reestablishes? Oh, I must add, I must add something to this answer. Um, in younger patients, leg length discrepancies, which in kids is super interesting because when you load the shorter side, you actually stimulate growth. So I do repetitive scanograms after they've grown at least a centimeter and a half to two centimeters to check. And I've had some really cool results. Um, we from your side. We've got quite the audio from you coming through the side. Talk up. Get closer to the microphone. Can you hear me now? That's better, yeah. Carry on. So we, I was saying that in kids, when you have a, a particularly big growth spurt, uh, generally in adolescence, um, we do the scanogram and we'll find that it's about eight, nine millimeters. So we'll put in an orthotic to correct. We'll do strengthening with that as well. I generally advocate strengthening from the moment that my orthotic is uh, dispensed. We start with physio and then go into um, strengthening as the physio has loosened everything up and is discharged patient onto bio. But the interesting thing about kids who are still growing is it's important to repeat the scanogram to make sure that you are measuring off, like you're measuring consistently, because as you load the shorter side, it should grow, they should grow out of, the, they could grow out of the leg length. I've seen some nice results with this where I've seen leg lengths shorten um, or reduce uh, with l proper loading. I don't know what your comment is on that, Sean. Oh, well, definitely with kids, you're always going to monitor them over a period of time because remember that, as I said, the, the body is asymmetrical left side to right side. So this growth spurt, this side can grow faster than that side. Now there's a leg length difference. So next time this one catches up. But so you need to follow them all the way through. Obviously, be mindful of scoliosis in, in kids who've gone through big growth spurts. But once you've gone through that process, you're going to keep assessing them to get to a point where you can say, well, this is how you are. Because once the growth plates have closed, infused that's where you are so you need to monitor them over a period of time definitely don't assume because he had a leg length difference at 13 he's still got the same leg length difference at 16. Yeah. yeah there's another question here is there a history of a grandparent and a parent having an ld and at what age should one do a scanogram on kids um there's not again not, I, you know i hate applying rules in medicine uh going to be looking at the child if there's absolutely no problem you know take them for an assessment take the kid for an assessment and let get reassess them in a year if there's no problem yeah. but if there's a big difference so say for example there's a family history of a one and a half centimeter difference in the last four or five generations 
then there's a very good chance it's going to happen in this generation. So keep be mindful of it. You can't change it. You can't stop it. It's a genetic process. So you can then monitor it and manage it where, if and when it becomes a problem. So, Karen Cohen, I get your joke. So, so let me read the joke. So when I met a girl with, a, with an LLD, I asked her what her name was. She said it was Eileen. I said, I know that you have one leg shorter than the other, but what is your name? <laughs> a bit of a comedic relief in the middle. Okay. You're going to have to email it. I missed it. I couldn't, we couldn't hear you this side. Okay. I've got another one here. Can a leg length difference contribute to sciatica? Can a leg length difference contribute to? Sciatica or periformis syndrome. 100%. Yeah. Think about if, if it's causing a pelvic tilt, which is going up into the lumbar spine, and that causes the disc to move, now you've got a compression of the disc. The problem is the sciatica. The cause is the leg length difference. But now you've got to be careful how you manage that. Because if you just go slap in the right side, you're going to be okay, mate. You might not, because now the disc might move again. So you've got to be super careful how you manage it. But can it contribute? 100% it can contribute. Yeah. I've, you know, doing, doing a scanogram results in so many interesting results, as, a, as Sean has highlighted tonight. I've had some fantastic examples Christine, who's also listening tonight, referred a patient to me with a beautiful scoliosis. And we said, well, let's just do the scanogram just to make sure that we don't have anything contributing from a lower limb perspective. And she was actually perfectly equal once we did the scanogram, which is great. So we didn't touch her. Um, I've had another patient who has had four back surgeries, rhizotomy, laminectomy, disectomies, L4, L5, crazy pain came over, like came hunched in, couldn't stand up straight, could hardly walk, could hardly sit. And um, the bio actually referred him to me and said, look, I think that you have a leg length discrepancy. We did the scanogram and he had two centimeters. Putting one lift in, putting, we started him off at a centimeter because he had such a hectic fallout. And with just one centimeter, instantly, instantly, he stood up straight and he walked with remarkably reduced pain. So awesome. sometimes podiatry. Thing. Yeah. I said sometimes podiatry is easy. Yeah. Not all. <laughs> now the question, what causes one side hip stiffness and how can it be corrected? How long is a piece of string? This what causes one side hip stiffness? There's so many possible causes. So you need to evaluate whatever you know, and if you're not finding things from your particular perspective, get get input from other practitioners. Don't be scared because you don't get the answer to send the patient to someone else. You know, is it is it chiro? Is it bio? Is it muscle shortening? Is it osteoarthritis? Send the patient where they got to go. Get the answer. Put the patient front and center and find the problem. So what causes hip stiffness? We haven't got time tonight to discuss all the things that can cause hip stiffness. But you'll generally, if there is a leg length discrepancy, you're going to find a, a one stiff hip. And this is why multidisciplinary is so important, because once you've put your lift in, it doesn't mean that, you know, all the orthotic to functionally accommodate this leg length. You know, you, you're not automatically, this patient is not going to automatically come into position and pain is going to be gone. You have an issue of a QL shortening. You're going to have like a really tight hip on one side. If we need a physiotherapist, once the physio is finished, we then need the strengthening to happen. So that's why, it, again, multidisciplinary is so important. Everybody has a finger in this pie. Okay. Well, we're going to see if there are any questions on our side. So Ooh. we're going to have and leave you from Cape Town. Okay. Any more questions? There's no more I don't see any questions that side. What question here? Yeah, hold on. Okay, so I'll have to do it afterwards. I've been asked to demonstrate resting in a calcaneal stance position, which I'll do with the group here. Okay, is that all the questions from your side? Any more questions on the side? No one else? Clear as mud. Confuse you all. Fantastic. All right. Hey, Lauren. People Thank enjoy. you so much, Sean. That was wonderful. It was a great talk. And uh, we'll chat soon. Okay, cool. Cheers, guys. Just a reminder to everybody that there is a Josie Wish um, 
hand webinar coming up on the 10th of May. And um, there will be a notice going out about that as well. Thanks for joining us, guys. Have a very good evening.